well, we've only had one square in this huge hall for lessons. I go, keep your square small. Um, it's also good if dancers have eye contact with other dancers rather than looking at the floor. You can't really tell who you're dancing with if you're looking at the floor. Um, and a square is a team. You have to work together as a team. Um, a couple years ago, I was teaching spin chain the gears at my plus class. And I said, this is a team sport. You have to all work together. Nobody can go too fast. Nobody can go too slow. And it was like a drill team. I mean, I was like, the first night, I was like, whoa, do this all the time, people. Um, so that's some of the things that, that, some of the things that dancers need to be, need to know to help with their styling and successful dancing. But things that callers need to know to help that is you need to know the calls, you need to know the definitions. And first on that is you need to read the current definitions. How many read them every year? How many know that since the 1st of March there have been three changes in the mainstream definitions? You know that? Not everybody, right? Um, and you especially need to read it before you start teaching a class so that you're not teaching old styling. And along with that, we tend to teach as we learn to dance. Now, some of us learned to dance a long time ago, and some of the styling has changed. And we need to read up on the current one so that we're not teaching it the way we learned it. The other is to deliver the calls with correct timing to help facilitate smooth dancing, enunciation, and diction, particularly as our population ages, those that are hard of hearing, even with hearing enhancement, don't necessarily hear what we say. I have a couple of dancers that are very confused with right and left. Now, to those of us that hear well, they sound totally different, but if you have some kind of hearing loss, they sound the same. Um, as callers, we need to avoid the stop and start dancing. You know, square through four, wait, 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 right and left through. You want to do it um, smoothly. And the other thing that I find that helps is if you dance with your dancers. Sometimes we're so busy, we're calling every night, and we don't have time to dance, but I think we need to make a point of going and dancing with our dancers so that we see what the issues they're having, but they also know that we know how to dance. But then we, for doing that, we need to model good dancing, like 32 beat grand squares with no swings in them, back-to-back dos a dos. When I was a new caller and started teaching, somebody asked if I practiced what I preached, and I go, absolutely. Then several years after that, somebody at Collar Lab asked if I did the swing, my husband and I did the swing dos I do, and I go, no. And they go, do they do it a lot in the Northwest? I go, no. But then I realized they don't when we're dancing with them, because they know we do the back-to-back dos I do to model that, but more and more are doing the back-to-back dos I do. Um, so the bottom line is we really need to practice what, they, what we preach in terms of good dancing, good styling, good timing. Um, so my bottom line is be kind, be courteous, trust each other, work together as a team, don't rush, smile and have fun. So that's kind of my introduction with what kind of the foundation of styling. And I will turn it over to Bob and I will add if I need to add. All right. <coughs> Styling to us is is a is a simple thing, and as you can tell, I like to wander around, turn me down just a hair, <coughs> blowing in the wind. Um, can you put on a piece of music? Just anything, any any piece of pattern. My power cord has gotten mixed up with somebody else's power cord. I don't have any kids. So if I'm standing here and I'm standing with my weight on my heels, 
and I'm standing, you know, like I would in a square without music. When the music comes on, I tend to shift into dance position, meaning my feet come apart, my knees get bent, I put my hands out, and I'm ready to dance. When you talk styling, you have to talk about what you're doing. Now, we've been saying for decades, square dancing is like walking. To be quite honest, I'd like to say, no, it is not. Because when I dance, I'm going to slide my feet. And notice my head's not going up and down. I'm not bouncing. I'm sliding my feet. I'm walking with the music. I sometimes refer to it as keeping my motor running. And even when I'm standing at home, my feet are moving. Maybe a balance. Notice I'm dancing with the music. I'm one of those people that people look at in squares and they go, don't they dance well? The only reason why they get to say that is because I'm spending my time dancing to the music. Because I'm dancing, right? You feel it? All right, that's the first thing. So my knees are bent, just a hair. I'm on the balls of my feet. Notice I can move in any direction. And notice that my motor is running and with the music. If the music was slower, I'd be slower. If the music was faster, I'd be out of breath. All right. Thank you. So the point I want to make about styling is it's how you dance and how you stand. If you stand with your weight on your heels, slumped over, looking at the floor, are you ready to dance? Do you have style? No, you don't. This is my wife. This is that Lynn. And we don't get to dance a lot together because I'm calling or she's queuing or whatever. So when we do things, the other thing is, is we grew up in our square dance lives in the shadows of the Rocky Mountains and with the heritage of Lloyd Shaw and with a regional difference of hands up choreography. And you'll see in my handout, I acknowledge regional differences and all of the things that go on in different parts of the country. But there are certain characteristics which you'll see in my write-up that relate to that history. And the most important thing about styling is Susan just said this, you're a team of eight people. If you're not dancing with all the same style, you're, you're somewhere along the way having hand battles. And, I, and dancing here is, is one of the things that I consider. Last night I was going, okay, am I doing a swing through with my hands down here? Am I doing a swing through with the forearm? Or am I doing a swing through with my hands up? All right? Quite honestly, I can dance any one of, the, of those styles. If you're gonna have a square dancing in style, they all have to be consistent, okay? So you have to get into a square, and we actually do this with our exhibition team. We'll get into the square and we're going, okay, oh, there's four of us, okay. Hands up, because all we, li we like to dance hands up. That means everything hands up, including right and left throughs and square throughs and Thing, and, and right and left grands, because that's where we started. In the 70s, as I started to teach, and Color Lab began to create definitions, we came down, to the, we changed our method of teaching to the Color Lab definitions. And what does that mean? That means things like right and left grands or handshakes, right and left throughs or handshakes. Uh, it means that man's hands are on the bottom, lady's hands are on top. It means uh, right, uh, ladies' chains are, are handshakes for the ladies, man's palm up, ladies' palm down for the gents. Now, all of this is styling. And when you read the definitions 
the call to our definitions, you see, well, what is the styling written down? They talk about dance position. This is dance position. Okay? It's lady's hand on top of man's hand, and, and usually not joined over here. So you have this dance position. Now, if we go on with that and say, okay, let's not get into the details of whether which hand position we're using or which part of the country we're in, because that's an argument no one is going to win at the moment. Um, but, but my main point that I wrote up was, if you have a square, you have to understand, no matter where people came from, if you want it to look good, they all need to dance the same style. Last year at the National, I was doing an awful lot of dancing down here because the Northeast has a lot of dancing down here. And I suppose if I'm going to Florida, I'm going to get a lot of arm, arms. Those are, the, the, those are the realities. But if you want a square to be to look really good, everyone has to use the same. All right. Now, as a person, and when we talk about dancing, and we go back to some teachings from the Shaw world, in that when we're going to lean forward on the balls of our feet, we're gonna, our heels are off the floor, and it's tough and on carpet to, to show this, but we're basically able to do this. It's harder than this, and and we're gonna act, we're gonna stand tall and put our head up, and we're gonna look at people, and we're gonna act like there's a string tied to our breastbone that's aimed up there. And then we're going to dance. See how that smooths out? See how smooth that is? If you could teach your dancers to do that. Now, if we dance like this, heels down, jumping up and down, what's the difference? Which do you like best? What makes you look good? What is going to make dancers look and feel good and dance better? One part of it's the choreography, but another part of it is all about how you hold yourself and how you enjoy dancing. And we have been told, and we try to do this, that we exude joy. And that is because we really truly love what we do. And when we're dancing, we can dance smoothly, slide our feet, move to the music, and so on. Now, on individual pieces of choreography, when you look at the dance style of a particular figure, um, say a right and left through, and, and I say, okay, we're gonna do this without the other couple, but imagine if they're there. So we're doing a right and left through. We're doing a right pull by. I'm falling a little behind. The pivot point is directly between us as we courtesy turn. We'll do it back. Right, I fall a little behind. The pivot point is directly between us as we courtesy turn. It's not a courtesy turn, or it's not a right and left through. We're gonna do it wrong. It's not a right and left through where I stand here and make her go around me and it's not that. Notice how smooth the other one was, and that was without other people. But the difference is, is where's the pivot point? Pivot point is right here, on a right and left through. We were dancing at the Community Dance Leader Seminar over the weekend, and we were doing a lot of ladies chains and right and left throughs, with courtesy turns. And I was going, okay, they're not keeping it here. I didn't mention it, but it was not here. It was about here. Those men were making those ladies move around. And then we were out of position because we were not lined up with the other couple. This stuff, you know, you're going, okay, so that doesn't help us do right and left throughs better. But if you don't teach this well enough, the dancers won't be successful enough. And that's really the issue. Um, so, that's one piece of styling associated with it. Now, the other thing is, is can I have all the ladies stand up? Okay. 
And ladies, gents, you can do this if you want to. I want you to hold out your hand, and I want you to hold your hand as, as if you had just dropped a handkerchief out of your thumb and index finger. If you just drop the handkerchief, your fingers are out, okay? If you stand there and bend your elbow a little bit, not, not this way, bend it sort of where your elbow is coming down. <laughs> if you can, if you can. So, so if you're looking pretty, you can have your hand out here and it can be gorgeous, okay? If you're wearing a full enough skirt, like Alan is, she can do the, effectively the same thing with the skirt, all right? Now, a star promenade this way, or a, a, pro, a skirt skaters promenade, looks really nice, doesn't it? Okay, notice my hand is palm up. Notice my hand is in the small of her back. This is styling. This is something we don't teach anymore. We say, okay, put your hand on the back of the lady. All right. I, I came out of the vintage where we were teaching 40 weeks of lessons. When you taught 40 weeks of lessons, you spent time on styling because you had time to do it. When you're trying to teach mainstream in 12 to 15 weeks, this is one of the things that gets left behind. Along with courtesy and history and a few other topics. So that's off our current topic list, but... <laughs> Susan's going to keep me honest here. Um, but I think that's really important to think about is that we don't teach this because we don't have time. See, because we're told we don't have time to teach it. Yes, you may. Can I add something? Um, one, if you can do the good styling that they just showed, particularly like with the right or left through or the promenade, you don't get as tired and you can dance more uh, and it looks better. And this gliding step saves knees and hips for all of you dancers that have trouble with knees and hips. So, we didn't go into, if you go into the definitions as they're written, and you read the styling section, it's not very much in most cases. It's the classic hand position. If you, basically, Okay, if you've done it equivalent to a touch a quarter, you've done, you're here, and that's all it says. Now, there's a couple of things about hand position. If you've done a touch a quarter, I want you to look at the thumbs. They're tucked in. The only, um, there's this hand position for opposite facing dancers, where the thumbs are, are loose on the back of the hand and the fingers are against fingers. There's the palm to palm with the, hand, the thumbs tucked in. The one that is absolutely not recommended is what we refer to as the thumb grip. So as a styling, this is something I walk around the floor and move people's thumbs. I will do this, <laughs> okay? Because everyone at one time or another has had their thumb pulled. And it's usually pulled by a well-meaning, newer dancer who's nervous. And that's all you need to know about, okay? Now, so, so there's these two. And the forearm, the other thing about forearm is we tend to get forearms that are like this. Well, forearms that are like this don't give you anything to do, okay? Because we're just slipping, and then people grab. And then we get the bruise here and the bruise here from the thumb, okay? So the way you guard against that, you get close enough so that this arm is at a right angle. And then I can pull on her forearm and she can pull on mine and we can turn around really fast because we're counter dancing. Does that make sense? All right, doesn't matter whether it's right or left, we can go around and my thumb isn't even in contact because our arms are, okay? I know it doesn't say anything, yes. Oh, oh, we got a recording going on. So here comes the microphone. Yeah, help him out there. 
Chuck Simpkins from Grants Pass, Oregon. Uh, you and your partner are symmetrically solid, okay? Right. You get dancing with dancers that are taller and smaller. That forearm is, and I see it all the time, and I pick on my little dancers about it, but my wife alone will get the bruise on the back of the elbow from grabbing the guys, the guys grabbing so far behind that there's becomes a bruise behind that elbow. Symmetrically, you guys are great. Get any other difference, and that, that can happen right there. So when I'm teaching, I purposely say neither hand goes beyond the elbow. So yes, we could both do this, but and you're right when you get we have a a gentleman that dances with us who's six four and is not going feet. Six eight and it's not gonna feed you. He's tall. I, I'm always looking up like this, and he's got long forearms, and we have some very small ladies. And but he knows about reaching, basically, to the inside of the elbow rather than that. So it's an important point. Yeah, I. This is Susan Morris. I just say halfway between wrist and elbow, so that. Well, the, the biggest thing is is what I've been encountering here a lot is this which gives you nothing. You, what you've got is, I would rather have this than a wrist, wrist grip. And I'd much rather have this when it's a forearm and this when it's a hand. Because the, the halfway in between is, is something that is just totally unpredictable and has no, this actually, I, I think I'm gonna hurt somebody by accident. And this is all about safety, it's all about smoothness the style in which we dance. Alright, so um, if you have significant height differences, um, one of the young callers that's here uh, this week, she's about yay tall. Um, if she was dancing with somebody a lot taller, and we have a young lady in class that's about yay tall, uh, maybe. Um, there's a point where you, you don't go for forearms, you go for hands. And it's okay. She's coming up and as high as she can. And the hand is either coming from the bottom or from the top, depending upon the size of the chain. So you adjust. And you don't get overly, particularly if they're younger dancers, you don't get excited. Um, when you go through the list of the definitions and the styling that is in those definitions. You look at them and go, okay, so what's the styling on uh, skirt skaters promenade? What's the styling on a star promenade? Star promenade, you have the star, and the outside dancer's inside hand is theoretically on the shoulder in from the back of the gent. Now, when you find a lot of height differences, you may find that that arm is underneath. That's fine. If, it's, uh, um, if you're doing a star promenade in the other direction, it may be this way. So if she's in the star and I'm on the outside. Um, it doesn't really matter who it is, this is the star promenade position. It doesn't matter whether they're the same gender or opposite gender. It still is the star promenade position. I tend, I tend not to be able to. And a lot of guys probably can't come across and put their hand on the inside shoulder as easily as they can on the opposite shoulder. Some of them can't get my shoulder in here. <laughs> anyway, so being aware of of that as a styling point. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other. Can I add one more thing? Yes. Um, along with that, if you're resting somebody, your hand on somebody's shoulder is, you have to dance your own dance and hold up your own weight. It's not to lean on it. Um, the other with arm turns is no spaghetti arms. You need to have some weight. Dead fish, spaghetti arms. You have to have some weight behind so that the other dancers know there's a body at the other end of that arm. So, um, two or three little things here. The, you know, we, when we talk about swings, and swings is something that um, both my wife and I fully enjoy, 
We don't really like to count swings or even four count swings. We really enjoy eight to 12 count swings, but we don't get those in square dancing. We have to go to a contra dance to get that. Last night we had some wonderful 12 count swings with the Zesty Contra, which I think all of you missed except us. <laughs> all right, so, so when you swing, and how many of you feel you're good at teaching swing? All right, let me tell you my way and you can balance it against what you do. Most important thing is, is if I walk up and I go like this, and can I swing? Why not? My feet. Oh, I got a problem with my feet? All right, you think I need to get my right little toes opposite each other? Is this? All right, I can turn it this way so you can see it. All right, so if if we if we swing like this, are we going to swing nicely? All right, why is it a problem? Are you opposite footwork or me? You're supposed to. You weren't supposed to fix it. <laughs> All right, so so there's a couple of things, and I'll I'll, I'll quit being funny here. Um, most important thing is, is it's not the shoulder, it's the hip. She needs to pull her hip in so that it's adjacent to mine. We need to act as if there's a pole that runs vertically between our right hips. And we, what, what was causing the problem is she started on her right foot and I started on my left. Alright, so I always tell people, you're going to put your weight on your outside foot, and you're going to step on the, your partner's heel if you can. All right? Do you get that? All right? So I'm going to step, step. I'm trying to step on her heel, but she keeps moving her foot. All right? If I do it that way, everyone's going to be successful in a walk around swing. All right? Does that make sense? I don't know whether it matches what you do or not, it doesn't matter. Um, but if you think about swing being, first of all, the little toe on the right, my right foot is close to hers, but not lined up with it. And I'm going to take that foot, and I'm going to try to step on her heel while she's trying to step on mine. And I describe it that way because people can get, get it that way. Now, the fun thing about this, notice her hip is tucked in, her right hip, and I'm walking forward, and I'm trying not to get dizzy, and so is she, okay? But does that make sense? If you do it that way, you can move into doing a more exciting swing very quickly, because you can say, okay, let's speed that up a little bit, and let's push the scooter a little bit, and you can begin going faster, and faster, and this is a terrible floor to do this on. But if you do that, are you standing up? Good. Um, if you do it that way, you can then turn it into pushing a skateboard, pushing a scooter around, and you can get it to go faster. In the, in the definitions of swing, there's about five pages of how to do this, where to do this, under what conditions to do this. The simplicity of what I just showed is what you're going to be able to convey. About four or five years ago, Clark Baker and I were in the hall at a national convention, and he would swing me, and then I would swing him, and I'd say, no, 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 it's not that handhold, it's this handhold, and this is how you have your, your hips turned, and nobody wanted to watch. <laughs> <laughs> but we got a, a great detailed definition of some of the different characteristics of swing done in different forms and formats out of that. Yes? <laughs> With her, Chuck Simpkins may pass Oregon. Again, yes. Um, when she has her hip tucked in like that, how much of her weight do you actually have? Not very much. Try that again. I want to check that out. 
Um, so the other thing is, is that when you swing, you're not necessarily leaning back, but the faster you go, the more lean. The more, the, the more, yes, the more the arm knows that she's there. I will say that. But you don't. The, the most important thing is, is you can't. If she's, if there's nothing here, she, she can't. We can't swing in in that smoothness that we were trying to do. So there has to be some, some, some opposite dancing, some counter dancing in here. If there isn't, now, yeah, and I love all the ladies, I really do, but I would dearly love them to trust me. That is probably the best way that I can say it is, trust me ladies, I will not drop you. And we will swing far more beautifully if you will trust my right hand. Now, I can swing without my left hand. It's not a part of what's necessary in the swing. Because I've got my hip in. Because she's got her hip in, I can swing this way, the same way I could when her hand was there. Okay, because this hand here is, is helping her keep it in. It's the lead hand. It's the hand that's telling her when I'm gonna stop. It's all about my right hand, gentlemen. If I want her to roll promenade, it's as easy as that. Okay? If I want her to roll back, it's as easy as that. This is my hand of suggestion. Not demand, gentlemen. Suggestion. I, I, I release my fingers, and she rolls out. I push a little with my fingers, she rolls back. If she knows about the palm of my hand, she can feel the palm of my hand, and she can feel the ends of my fingers. And I'm not digging into her back. I'm gently have them hand. When I increase the pressure, she rolls in. When I decrease the pressure, she rolls out. This, gentlemen, is the way you lead a swing. It's the way you lead a lot of this kind of dancing. And if you're not teaching your gentlemen about that, you're, you're denying them some part that will make them feel like the gentleman that they should be in a sport house. I notice where you're placing your, your right hand, I teach it differently and I do look at the definitions all the time and that your hand is a lot lower than what I teach. Okay. Okay, that's, that's kind of what I, I look at and also gives the stability of that swing, especially if you're going faster. So, you're, you're right. And there are two, two camps of this. There are, there is the round dance world, international folk dance world that has your hand right under the elbow or right, right under the shoulder and the, the hand on the um, shoulder blade, okay? There's that line, and the, the principle of the hand, the palm, and the fingers is the same. Yes. Um, it's just the hand position. Um, what, what happens with most guys, and you have to ward them against that if you teach this, is the ladies end up doing this, okay? They end up leaning in because the gentlemen are pulling, okay? And, and if you're down here, the, you don't get as much of that. Now, we can fight all day about which is right and which is wrong, it doesn't matter. What matters is what works. And what matters is, is that you want the ladies, when you're swinging and you're doing that fast swing on a nice floor, you want to be able to lean back and smile at each other. And the more you can look at each other's eyes, the less you're going to get dizzy. And so if you're looking here, and if she can't stand to look at you, tell her to look at your bolo, because that's what it's there for. Um, <laughs> Question over here. Connie Waterman, Las Vegas. Um, I do the boys' part as well, so I swing. As a matter of fact, I've been told I swing better than a lot of the guys, but in the guys' position. But I found that I have to have it down at the waist, or the lady tends to back away or, or, or lean back a little bit too much, and there's no control if you don't have it down there. Up higher, it just doesn't seem to work for me, and um, I don't get as good a swing. 
distribution of weight. Yeah. What? It's what? distribution of weight. Count the count cable. Distribution of weight. In other words, if you got your hand up too high, guess what goes up? If you got it down too low, guess what happens? Distributes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He says he gets slapped. <laughs> so, so the the other thing is, so, so I don't want to spend all day on the swing, but I did want to talk about it a little bit because it is one of those things that make gives you style. And um, now the other thing is is about twirls. Yes. Oh, before we go away from swings, if you see, if we all teach our dancers. This or similar to this, you know that boys are walking forward, girls are walking forward, but you all of a sudden see them doing bad habits. Like all of a sudden this year, I had girls backing up when they're swinging. It's like, girls, what in the world are you doing? Stop it. You know, talk to them individually. Take another teaching session on swing. Try to keep them from avoiding bad, starting bad habits. The, the reason why we've lost swing is because we haven't taught swing. That would be my opinion. <laughs> I specifically <laughs> Chuck. All right. Chuck Simpkins, Grants Pass again. Um, I specifically take time out to demo yes. a swing, and I, I jokingly, you know, tell the girls that if he's swinging you and that hand goes down too low, you've got the other hand that's right there by the shoulder, poke him in the ear. All right. Do I something already, to get his attention to get it in the right spot. I Let them know. Yeah, I already tell people that she's she's got a good left hook. Just beware. So <laughs> you have to take that time out and actually demo, yes. in my opinion, demo the swing. And actually, you might even have to move around the room if you have that many squares to show that. Yes. The comment I would make is don't do it just once. Correct. Because you might do it. Um, you might do it a first night, you might do it a third night, you might do it a fifth night, you might do it a tenth night, depending upon your teaching sequence. Another, another. <clears throat> yes, we want it to be an interactive session, so the more input we get, the better. Risha Schlitter from Cary, North Carolina. Um, obviously, it takes a lot of time and effort to teach a proper swing. What do you think the role of a swing is when you do like one-off, open house, fun dance? Um, do you ever teach? I do, I do not. Or if I do, if there's a swing in it, I'm going to do this kind of a swing because I can come out into a promenade or I can come out to a circle and one of the other things is is I can do this with any gender with any gender and there's not an issue here. So if you're, you can do an open one but you don't have as much control, you can do it like a circle and turn out. But if you can do it, shake hands, reach underneath, shake the other hand. Now, put the right foot in and buzz. You can go around as fast with this one as you can with the other one. It's a lot of fun, but you got to get people to do it. And I tend not to use swings at all, which causes me a lot of problems when I want to do contra dances. Cal wants to. Yes. I don't do swings. Cal Campbell, I don't do swings at parties. Uh, there is too much danger in the fact that you're going to be able to find people that can't do it that are going to injure themselves. And it's going to happen whether you want it to happen or not. And so I eliminate I don't use swings. So you, you, you know that for those of us, those of you who know me, Cal and I do a lot of dance parties. And if we're we're using circle left, circle right, forward and back, arm, arm turns, do to do, uh, maybe a couple of other things. We're using less than 10 calls to have a great time for two hours. And, and we do it by a variety of formations, a variety of other things. Come to next year's Community Dance Leader Seminar and you'll hear more about it. <laughs> um, but the point is, is there are things we don't do that and, and we have adaptations to things that allows us to accomplish what we need without things that are either dangerous or difficult that they will not be immediately successful with in those kinds of forums. And that's really the key. They're here to have fun, 
not to learn how to do mainstream square dancing. That's not what their purpose is. So let's let's go on. The twirls. The twirls. So let's see here. Um, let's say we were to we'll go from swings. If we're going to swing and we're going to turn, we're going to swing around, and if I'm going to promenade in the direction behind me, I'm going to start the twirl about here. And I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it so you can see it here. I'm going to do it by lowering my hand a bit, and as I bring it back up, I'm going to be turning backwards so that she can turn under the arm and go around and I can merge right into it. It's as important to know where to start a twirl out of a swing as it is to know how to twirl. So if we're swinging and I'm getting around about here, I'm starting the twirl. And that's in slow motion so you can see it. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So, all right. So I'm going around, signal, twirl. And everybody says, well, how did I change hands? Do you see where I changed hands? Yes, I got her around here and I twirled her around. I was able to bring the hand down and I can just take her hand in mine and we can go on around. You cannot, for example, if we're, if we're doing a swing at home and we're going to twirl into a promenade, I'm going to finish the twirl somewhere over here. It's about a quarter, maybe a little more, depending upon how fast it is. You cannot, you know, if, if you decide to swing at home and you twirl at home, you've got to be careful because you've got to bring her right here. I actually don't recommend twirling at home. You twirl into home. If we're promenading, and this is another, another twirl, we're promenading, let's see, two, two, two. We can be in three. So, all right. So, we're going to twirl out. We're going to twirl out as if we're the number three couple. So, we're going to go around two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Okay. Okay. Yoda to me dropped his hand to tell his partner where he's going to start to. Yeah. Notice that he drops his hand to give Ellen a signal that they're going to start into a turn. Watch it. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That tells the lady that she's going to start her turn. So this is, you know, some of this is because we've been dancing, performance dancing for close to 40 years. Susan asked me how many years I've been calling. She's been dancing 52 years, 52 years, I've been calling for 43. So we've been down a couple of roads. Cal's got me beat, but <laughs> Cal and Judy's got me beat. But we've been down this other over here. Um, because we performance dance, we talk about when do you signal, how do you lead it, who's leading, who's following. And, and it's important. People say, well, square dancing doesn't require that the man do lead. Wrong. Not in our world. Our world, the men do lead. The left-hand dancer is a lead. They lead. Okay? Even when she's dancing the ladies' part, she's leading if she's dancing the left-hand part. Go ahead. Rick Manning, California, Westminster, California. Yes. I teach straight as well as gay clubs. Okay. And I notice the difference between the two. When I teach the swing and also the, the twirl out, I tell the ladies that you're going to be out in front of that man. You, you're, the man's leading you out in front. The gay community is always right beside me. I don't know why, and I cannot break them of that habit. Suggestion? Um. Is this a like a swing twirl to a promenade? Yes. Okay. 
It's a swing and twirl as they're coming out of the okay. promenade, um, and it's also a swing at home. They're doing it right beside them. They're never leading their girl out in front, especially in the gay community. Okay. And the straight community, I can get the gals out there and the men to lead them out in front. Um, a little bit, probably most of those people dance both spots and they don't understand the, the variances between the two. Um, because, because they are counter. And they need to under, begin to understand, and the only way you're gonna do it is by having, talking to the, to the group and saying, okay, remember when you're the lead, this is what your, your role is. When you're in the follow position, this, this is what you should be doing. And if you're truly dancing both parts, you need to learn how to dance those parts in that way. Now, will they change? Probably not. But at least you've done your teaching job of, of, of expressing it. I guess I could lean over. <laughs> Alan Riggs, uh, Centennial, Colorado. You need to teach that right-hand dancer or demonstrate to everybody the, the visual difference and the physical difference between the, leading it so that the twirl continues around that circle or yeah the, the, the twirl is a four count move and it is down line of dance it it doesn't cause as much trouble with balance as one that's right here. That's a spin. It's not a twirl. So you can say we don't we don't want to suggest that you do a spin. We want you to do a twirl, which is it's a moving figure. It's not an in place figure. When, when I get twirled and the gent has stopped to twirl me, everybody else is stacked up behind us. And it's off. So the other thing about twirls, be in mind, and this is, this is a rather important characteristic. This hand can't be here. For her to twirl, it needs to be here. Now, what is this? And I, I use this term. This is a sky hook. This is not a crank. <laughs> this is where the, the left hook comes in. If you get crank, you can make a suggestion. That's not such a good idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, when you're teaching, when you're teaching, when you're talking about twirls, make sure that the ladies are holding their hand up. Now, if the ladies will will push their hand at the top, if the lady's hair is getting messed, it's her fault. Because she didn't push up on that hand, as long as it's over her head. Okay, does that make sense? I tell the story, and it's off center. I tell the story, there was a lady who danced with uh, Jim Barr's Round Dance Club. She always wore four inch heels. She was probably 6'2 in her stocking feet and in the time it was late 70s she always wore a hairdo that was at least four inches. <laughs> she was way up there for this 5'8 guy. Alright? She never, never bent over. She did, she did sometimes come down down at the knees but she never did this because she was a good dancer again that has to do with styling ladies when you're short you don't have this problem unless you're dancing with somebody who's really short but when you're tall guys you got ladies and there are ladies out there Susan's pretty tall yep proud. always stand up straight be yes. proud yes Carla Sim, Ken's Grants Pass. I'm 5'3", and I've danced with six-foot gentlemen who knock my glasses off my head. Well, I've got my arm as far as I can. It happens. Yes, it does. I, I don't want to de-emphasize that at all. All right, so um, here's a pet peeve, and I know it's a pet peeve of cows, because 
He said it more than once. When when you're standing in the square and the and the caller says side space grand square, how many counts does it take to get back here? How many counts does the average square take to get back here? What's the least you've ever heard? Sixteen. And they didn't. It's, it's it's totally amazing. All right, if you're going to do this with style, number one, it takes sixteen counts to go each each direction. Number two. How do you, what do you do with your hands? All right, notice we're joined here. If we go one, two, three, turn, I'm getting another hand. One, two, three, turn, I've got no hands. Now what do I do with my hands? I sometimes will go here for the men and out for the ladies, whether they have a skirt or not. Uh, one, two, three, turn, four, and one, two, three. Now, I may do any number of things. I may do a little bounce to acknowledge. I may do a hand to, to pat a cake to get away. Only when I get put into doing a swing do I do a swing. When the other, the lady is insisting. And then I back away. Now there's all sorts of things you can do to, to try to help people. I don't know whether you've ever watched Clark do a grand square when he's thinking about it, but he'll go one, two, three, boom, boom, one, two, three, boom, boom, one, two, three, boom, boom, one, two, three. <laughs> it's hilarious to see an entire floor. <laughs> no, it doesn't. You, you, you do it as you turn. It's a it, it, it's just there, and and what it is is I actually do, do I often do cha chas on the corner uh, because it, it it allows me to accentuate it, and, and as callers I would encourage you to make sure you're taking four steps on the side. The other night I was dancing and and uh, the the lady was my opposite, and we did a grand square and. Did a, did a grand square and everybody was doing normal and stuff and she's already there and, and I'm standing here and she's looking like I'm doing something wrong because I'm not there with her okay so I walk up one two three four and then we go then she reverses and she's moving too fast and now she's waiting for me and then we Sometimes she even falls back without me. Um, so, what I said earlier about the square dancing together, if you can emphasize that this is a team sport and you need to do it together and the calls take a certain amount of time, that would be my comment about it. Because when you see a whole square do a grand square in unison, unison, it's really cool. Over the weekend, we were showing people how to do a progressive grand square. We were doing We've done men face grand squares and ladies face grand squares. None of those work if you don't take 32 counts to do it. I would just add, um, when Larry and I are dancing together, we take the proper amount of time and the others, op our opposites are always like, well, oh, where are you? But once they see that we're slowing down, then they slow down also. Yep. So dance, be the example. While you're on that, can you show the cha-cha? <laughs> Show the cha-cha. All right. So, um, so let's go. And it's one, two, three, and four. 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 It just it now is that styling. Yes. Is it some way to get people to do four steps on a side? Yes. Is it is it a variant of what we normally do? Yes. Will it change what people's behavior is? Not likely. But will people have fun with it? Yes. Will they remember what our point is? Yes. So if they change, 
that's their choice as dancers, but at least we've made a, an attempt to say this is what really happens. You could use cha-cha music when you teach. So, well, yes. Warren Gaskill, Rainbow Squares, uh, Bellingham, Washington. One of the things that I use when I find that grand squares start falling apart, especially early in lessons, is I'll teach them on the turn, clap. You get them be the dancers doing a uniform, synchronized clap, they will stay in time. They love that. That, that actually works really well. Yeah, clapping is, is another one besides the cha-cha as, as a mechanism, and we have used that too. Do you clap on four or on one? On four. So it's on four. On four. Okay. Just, just, just check it. Um, so we've got two different topics, and we've got about ten minutes left. Susan, do you? You got more, more to add? Here? No. I'm okay. Are you good? I'm good. All right. Um, the two topics are this. We've been talking about the the skills of what you would teach in a class, and what would you teach normal dancers. You should know that there are, there are a lot more flourishes and a lot more things you do when you move from regular dancing to performance level dancing. And when you move to performance level dancing, there are a lot more flourishes that are done with, uh, with twirls, and there are uh, a lot more skirt work for the ladies. And uh, so when you do a grand square, ladies, you might do it with your, your hands out and the men's hands behind, uh, just below the belt. And you might start out like this. And, and you go four, go. One, two, three, turn. One, two, three, turn. One, two, three, turn. One, two, three. So there's things you do to make it look good in the styling. When you, when you do um, things like a lady's chain in skirt work, watch her right hand. She's going to do a figure eight as she leaves before she does the right hand pull by. So go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. Did you see what she did, ladies? She brought the hand over, down, up, and down. You can keep the skirt in your hand while you do that. All right, so, so, and any time, whether it's a right and left through or a lady's chain, that skirt work is just one of those flary things that can be done. All right, again, if you're in a performance or a competitive situation, you actually want all the ladies to do the same thing at the same time to the same kind of music. The other thing that we didn't start off talking about is when you performance dance, you want everyone Ladies included, step off on your left foot on the one beat of the music. So it's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That makes us all dancing together. If somebody steps off on their right foot on one, they're going to be out of sync with everybody else. If one steps off on, on their left foot and another couple steps off on their right foot, then you got this thing going like this. It's like an out of, out of tilt. It's a tilted square, so to speak. So one of the things we teach right off the bat is, is if you're going to circle left, start with your left foot. Go, circle left. One, two, three, four. Circle to the right. And one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, go forward and back. Go one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Listen to your music. It's hard to do without music. But if you listen to your music and you can dance with your left foot on ones and threes, you're, the whole thing looks better and feels better. That's the only thing you do. That's the only thing you do. Once a cow came, once again, what we teach in performance dancing, what used to be done by all square dancers, that when you stepped into the square and the music started, you started the four count balance. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. We taught the dancers to start the command after 
they finish the balance. This means that all four dancers start the motion at the same time. Okay, what happens now? When I say head to, right, left, through, it's a race. It's well, a race. Not only is it a race, but the one and three were standing on their toes, and two and, and or one was standing on their toes, and two was standing on their heels. So one moved into the middle on, on the one count, right. and the other, the number three, had to come off their heels. So how many beats did they lose? Two. two. They lost two. Right. So instantly we've got this out of whack situation because not everybody moved at the same time. And if we could change one single thing in square dancing to improve square dancing, it would be to start reteaching the balance. Just as balance forward, moving, one, and so forth. One, two, three, four, head, two, right, lift through. Everybody goes at the same time. See what I'm getting at? And this makes a huge difference on what the floor does. It makes a huge difference to you as a caller. Because if you've got everybody started at the same time, then you can pace your timing, and the whole floor will be with you. So, moving to sort of the, go ahead with this question. Helen Alley, Portland, Oregon. How do you teach the dancers that little balancing skill on the one, two, three, four. Uh, uh, uh. So, 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 okay. the first, most important thing is, is you, you get people that say, okay, everybody stay on your right foot. Right. Swing your left foot, okay? Now, what we want to do is we want to step forward on that left foot, and now we want to swing the right foot up to it and back. Now we want to bring that left foot back and forward. Up and back, back and forward. Up and back, back and forward. And then you suddenly find yourself. Yeah, you don't want. I can't even do it. So you don't want them. You want them to stand tall in place. And what we're doing is everything's from the waist down. So we're forward and swing, back and swing, forward and swing. Okay. So that's all there is to it. Now, in the balancing definitions that talks about balances, they talk about different kind of balances. This is a regular forward step back step balance, four count balance. There are two step balances, and they look like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I'm changing weight on each side. And if I switch back, Notice I'm doing the same thing. I'm moving the same way. It's just the number of steps that I'm taking. So um, the piece of music that uh, Susan had on was pretty quick. Yeah, I think it's a little slower for this poor guy. Two other components. Number one, you have to turn the volume of music up enough that the dancers can hear it. Because what's happening today, I'm deaf. I can hear you talking, but I can't hear the music. On 90% of the callers, I can't hear the music. Okay, so you start up, and you say, okay, get them into what Bob is talking about, and get them used to the fact that you start the music. Wait a little bit. Wait a little bit. The other thing that's got to be done is you have to pick out music that's in eight count phrases. If you pick out some of the stuff that's done today, and particularly the older music, you're picking music up it's in two to four count beats. All right, so listen to this music. You know where the one beats are? One. One, two, Now, if you get people to recognize where the one beat, put on a different piece of music. Can you please? <laughs> All right, we're almost out of time, and I did want to cover one more thing. Pick something. All right. So. 
And you as a caller should have no trouble picking out one beat of the music you select. I bet you Susan doesn't even have one that's hard to select. <laughs> that's accessible. All right, that's enough. Um, it is two o'clock. All right. So we're gonna let Susan do a couple of wrap-up things, but the one thing I wanted to say is beyond the stuff we've been talking about, the next part that would take another 15 to 20 minutes to talk about would be what I would talk about is delivery of calls. If you can't deliver the calls in a timely manner that allows the dancers to move from one move motion to the next smoothly, you have stopped styling. You have prevented styling from occurring. If you do a square through four and you don't say swing through or right and left through with the appropriate timing such that their body positions are allowed to evolve and they can move between, they're going to fail or they're not going to look good. So part of styling is your, you as a caller's problem. And that's all about delivery. And yes, I could talk another 20 minutes on that topic. Great, or we can have a whole different session on that. Yes. Okay, so a big hand for Bob and Ellen Rick. Big hand for Susan. All right. Susan. Thank you, Bob. Thank you all for coming. There um, are handouts up here on the table. Great, right. there's handouts. They're side by side. I think they're side by side. Great. Right. Side by side. So, um, <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Have a great rest of your convention. We'll see you around. that so the guy because the girl's not the right hand she's not moving forward on the scroll the guy can't touch that's part of the problem when they're doing more than the and they're trying to get back to the shop no listen then there's not way to stop it the guy's got a chance to move it because it's always well like anyway Thank you. 
through the membership online. Um, there's also a form in here um, that you can make a copy of. I tried to make it so that if you needed to tear it out, you could. Uh, well, yeah, I, I actually had so many really long articles this time. I'm the editor of this now. And yeah, Ina is not. Oh, and, and then you know what? If, if I don't have anything to put in from other people, they have to put up what I put in. Very often, I, I started to go back to the very first year, and, and I would pull dances and little articles, you know, from 1974 or something. Oh, yeah. Well, and the membership has changed. So it's a lot.
here too? Resolve. And remember, to cite 
there's really two parts of it. There's the site calling, where you just, you know, there's different methods of calling, but the extemporaneous form where you just get up and you just call whatever you want, and then when it comes time to resolve, you start to look for probably what we call key couples or key people in a square that you might have remembered or have written down beforehand. And then you get into resolution mode. And um, you can always tell a beginner site caller um, or a site caller in general who's having trouble because they're going along great guns and you're dancing to them and it's smooth and it's great. And then they decide to resolve and all of a sudden the train slows down and slows down and it's like, uh, pass through, bend the line, uh, no, 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 right and left through, uh, no, no, pass through, bend the line. So, and that's common. It's very common. And it's, I don't say this to be critical. First of all, I've never heard most of you call in this room anyway. So, but in general, I've heard it enough and it's heard it enough. And that's why the resolution is just as important as the calling. Because the key to be a successful site, quote, caller is to resolve at the same speed as you call when you're doing your, your sequence. And that's not easy to do. Um, I'm going to hand the mic over to Ed in a minute. He and I usually go back and forth. We've done many sessions together. We will welcome comments from the floor. If things are working for you, tell us what you're doing. If you need help and you say, I don't know how to do this, uh, we're also going to show you methods that we use that are a little bit more sophisticated than the basic two-face line or facing line. And um, it's set up right away. You can use my microphone. But anyway, um, so don't be afraid to have questions. And we're going to get a square up and we're going to show you some things as well. I personally love site calling. Um, when I started the call in the 70s, that was the thing. I was just, we learned modules, and, and I'm a big proponent of modules, okay? Continue to hone your skills with modules. You can't ever get enough of them. But I have found, personally for me, I'll speak for me, I can't remember thousands of modules. Can you? I can't. And I also find with modules that, to some degree, I'm limited, okay? There's only so many I can remember or different get outs. So I like the freewheeling and the, the, the way of, of just calling. I want to just go out on the highway and drive at 65 miles an hour and just not worry about it until I have to get off my exit and then I want to start to resolve. That's what I love, okay? I find modules are great. I find them to be a good foundation to build your house on, but I I don't think that that's the only method we should ever use, and most uh, most experienced callers will say you should have two or three different methods, and then, and as some of you out here know, do that anyway. But I'm going to turn the phone, uh, the microphone over to Ed. Ed's got some opening comments, and we'll go from there. Yeah, I agree with everything that Ken said. I tend to call the same way. I always use sight. Um, for those of you that raised your hand and said you're you're still kind of working on site. What we're going to present today is is like the end goal for you to get to. And so if you're not there yet, jot these things down because to be a sophisticated site caller and just be able to freeway down the, the road at 65, like Ken said, you need to do these things. And so we started off talking about resolution. So the first thing that a successful site caller needs to do is to know the primary and secondary couple, right? We all know that. The key is there are rules for remembering the primary and secondary couple. And I have a handout entitled, How to Remember the Primary and Secondary Couple, and it's up here. So you can get that afterwards. But the key is you must remember primary and secondary couple in a minimum of three squares. Minimum of three squares. Because if you only have one square, now if, you only, if your club is only two squares, then forget that. But <laughs> say there's a group of five squares, you need three squares of memory primary and secondary couple. Because if you only know one square and that square breaks down, you're dead in the water. If you only know two squares and one of them breaks down, 
then you're going to retrench and call nothing because you're so afraid that the one remaining square will break down. But if you have three squares, now you have an insurance policy. And you can be pretty relaxed that all three squares aren't going to get down the drain. Personally, for me, I set up, I established primary and secondary couple in three squares before I even start the tip. And then as I'm going along, I'm looking to pick up a fourth square on the fly. My, one of my philosophies is, you can't have too much insurance. So the more squares I have, the better it is. Um, the primary couple. And some of the things I'm going to say may, see, may seem obvious. And why is he saying this? I'm saying it because I've seen so many people not, not do these things. The primary couple should be the easiest couple in the square for you to remember. That's automatic. That's an axiom. That's automatic. But so many callers say, well, it must be couple number one, because that's the way it was done at our caller school. And granted, that's the way it tends to be done at caller schools, and we may even do that here. But the key is that the primary is whoever is easiest for you to remember in the square. Whoever is easiest to remember in the square. So in this square it may be couple number two, in this square it may be number one, in that square it may be couple number three. Very important mental rule. No, no mental effort to remember the primary couple. You look at a square, the primary should jump right out at you. If it doesn't, if you look at this square and the primary couple does not jump out at you, you do not use that square because of the basic rule. No mental effort to remember the primary couple. So you go to another square. And why do I say no mental effort to remember the primary couple? Because if you have three squares, you have six couples in there. People say, gee, I can remember six couples. That's so many. Well, if the primary leaps out at you in three squares, now you're down to three couples you've got to remember. Just the secondary couples. So that's, that's one key thing. No mental effort to remember the primary couple. Here. And location in the square is immaterial. By the way, if any of you have any comments or questions at any time, don't feel you're interrupting us. Just come up, pick up the mic that's on the chair there, and, and we'll go with that. Okay. Um, going? Just yeah. catch, do you want okay. Good. I say we just let it keep going. The thing I also, if I had that a dollar in all the years of I'm going to pause all the time quickly. Teaching callers, if I had a dollar for every 